So in this video, we will check out number three from the 2017 AP Calc AB and BC exams. And they gave you this graph in number three, and it's a non-calculator question. They tell you that the function f is differentiable between negative six and five and it satisfies this condition x is negative two the y value is seven graph of f prime is shown here and we've got two excuse me three line segments one two three and then the semicircle down here below the x-axis find the values of f of negative six and f of five i actually started by finding f of five if you're looking for f of five you might find it helpful to think of this in terms of an application uh, this is a derivative, the, the graph that we have access to. So this is a rate of change. So th this graph is showing how the function f is going to change. So if, if you think about this in terms of, say, a velocity and position problem, we've got a velocity graph, and we want to answer a question about the function value at 5. So what we would do is we would take the function value or the position at uh, some known spot, in this case the x value of negative 2. So we would start with the, the position of the object at negative 2, and we would add on how much the position changes by between the time when the position was 7 and the time when we want to know the position, which in the case of this first calculation that we're doing here is 5. And so it's it's helpful, I think, to think of this question in terms of an application like that. Uh, and if you're wondering where this expression came from, hopefully that discussion is, is going to help see where, uh, why we arrive at it. But if we want to do this computation, we're, we're starting with the function value at 7 and we're adding on how much the function value changes by between negative 2 and 5 by integrating the rate of change of the function we're going to have to use area arguments to, to build this conclusion. And so if you think about from negative 2 to 2, you have a semicircle that's entirely below the x-axis. So I'm subtracting off 1 half pi r squared, and that's definitely negative because we are below the x-axis, right? A definite integral computes an exact signed area. And then I had this triangle the rest of the way from 2 to 5 that sat above the x-axis, so I added that on 1 half base of three, height of two. You can leave your answer like what I boxed up here. I went ahead and simplified it a little bit. You get 10 minus two pi for that final answer. F of negative six is a bit trickier. We're gonna do the same sort of thing. We're, we're gonna start with the function value at negative two, and we're gonna add on how much the function value changes by between negative two and negative six by integrating that rate of change of the function, integrating the derivative of the function, through those limits of integration. Now what's weird here is that the limits of integration are not in the proper order. We have the larger numerical value as the lower limit of integration and the smaller numerical value as the upper. If we want to use signed area arguments to, to find the value of this definite integral, we're going to have to make sure the limits of integration are in the proper numerical order. And we can always switch the limits of integration, uh, upper limit to lower, and, and exchange them as long as we negate the sign out in front of the integral. So you notice I've swapped the limits of integration with each other, negated the integral, and then I had a, a quick calculation to do here. Um, between negative 6 and negative 2, all we have is we have this triangle that's entirely above the x-axis, so 1 half base of 4 height of 2 is going to be the value of this definite integral. And then if you subtract that off of 7, again, you can leave the answer as I have it boxed right here, or if you simplify it, you end up with 3. If we look at the next piece of the problem, on what intervals is f increasing, justify your answer. And so if you think about how you normally answer questions about where functions are increasing, you usually do that with a sign chart for f prime. And so you would need to know when f prime has the opportunity to change signs. And f prime has to first be zero or undefined in order to go through that sign change. And f prime is always defined. We have a point on this graph at any x that we look at between negative 6 and 5. But we do see two spots right here at the x of negative 2 and right here at the x of positive 2 where the function f prime of x is going to be equal to 0. And so these are the two spots 
within the interval negative 6 to 5 where f prime has the opportunity to change signs. What is the sign of f prime on each interval? Well, this is a graph of f prime, so we're just looking at the y value on this graph. The y value on this graph is positive between negative 6 and negative 2. The y value on this graph is negative between negative 2 and 2. And then the y value is back to being positive from 2 the rest of the way to 5. We know that a function is increasing anytime f prime is positive, and f prime is positive here and here. We can include the endpoints because there would be a point on the graph of f that we could use to compare with points immediately to the left or to the right uh, in order to establish the inequality that we would need to see in order to satisfy by the definition of an increasing or a decreasing function. So on these intervals right here, that would be where your function is increasing. This justify your answer bit. You definitely need to have more than the sign chart with the conclusion. That's what this little concluding statement was. So the, the key thing that had to be part of the justification is this phrase right there, f prime is positive on those intervals. Number three, or excuse me, part C of number three is kind of lengthy. Uh, they ask us for an absolute minimum value on the closed interval negative 6 to 5. And it's a minimum value of f. Now, using the extreme value theorem, which says if you're dealing with a continuous function on a closed interval, you are guaranteed to get both an absolute max and an absolute min. And those two values are always going to happen at either the endpoints of the closed interval or critical numbers within that closed interval. And so there were two things that I did to establish my list of candidates. I took the endpoints of this interval as candidates for the absolute minimum. And then the critical numbers are places where the derivative is either equal to zero or undefined. We just did that back in part B, right? Zero is the value of the derivative at negative two and two. And the derivative f prime, this graph is always defined. The nice thing about this calculation is, the nice thing about part C is we've already done a few of the calculations that we need to have access to in order to build our conclusion. We found this f of negative 6 in part a. We found f of 5 in part a. Uh, we're given that f of negative 2 is 7. So really all we need to do to, to compare all the y values at the possible places where the absolute min might be, all we need to do is figure out the y value at 2. So similar to what we did in part a, now we need f of 2, so starting with the, the y value on f at negative 2, and then adding on how much the y value changes by between negative 2 and 2 by integrating the rate of change of the function is going to give us that answer. So from negative 2 to 2, you're looking at just the semicircle that's below the x-axis with a radius of 2. I'm subtracting that off because it is below the x-axis. So compare this y value with this y value with this y value with this y value. This is definitely bigger than 3. Uh, 10 minus 2 pi and, and 3 are going to be in the same neighborhood. But think about this value here, 7 minus 2 pi. 2 pi is a little bit more than 6. 7 minus 6 is going to be the smallest of any of these four y values. So the absolute minimum value of f of x between negative 6 and 5 is this y value that we've just established right here. And then in the last part here, we want to now concern ourselves with the second derivative of f. We want to know what f double prime of negative 5 is. We want to know what f double prime of 3 is. Uh, find the value or explain why it does not exist. So f double prime of negative 5. Well, this is a graph of f prime. The derivative of f prime is f double prime. On a graph, a derivative is always found by, by thinking about the slope of a tangent line. On this line right here, the tangent slope is the same slope as the line itself. What's the slope of this line? Well, rise of negative 2, run of 4. We're looking at a, a slope of negative 1 half. So f double prime of negative 5 is negative 1 half, since the slope of this line segment is negative 1 half. f double prime of 3 is a little bit more interesting, because if you look at 3, what happens with the slope of the tangent line at this x right here on this graph of f prime? Well, you have a, a positive slope to the left of 3. You have a negative slope to the right of 3. The slope changes drastically as you pass through the x of 3. This is what we've called a cusp on the graph of f prime. And a tangent line can't be defined at a cusp. And, and therefore, f double prime of 3 is not going to exist since the slope of f prime changes drastically rather than gradually as we pass through that point. The one-sided limits for f 
primes values don't equal each other on either side of three. 